Good afternoon. My name is David Ritchie, and I'm a senior studying quantitative economics and international relations at Tufts. In the past, I've worked on community development in rural India, in rural India, studying Paris last spring. Guys, David, hold on a second. Last week, sorry. Thank you for your silence. Um, uh, I studied last spring in Paris, and I worked at the Pentagon in Advanced Systems Cost Analysis Division with Tufts Active Citizenship Scholar. Um, at Tufts, I danced in TDC, played classical violin, and lived in a French culture house. Currently, I'm working with Jean-Louis, one of our partners, and developing a good, uh, good government survey for Libya. Looking to the future, I will, be, I will be conducting research for EPIC this spring, examining the Moroccan monarchy the most recent push towards normalizing and documenting evidence. Today, I will be moderating our panel on civil and military relations, and security sector reform, and political transitions. I will introduce each speaker, who will have about 10 to 15 minutes, to speak on the topic. And we will hear two presentations from EPIC students, Sarah, Isabel, and Jackie. After this, I will open the panel up for a few moments to allow panelists to briefly respond to each other. Finally, I will open up the panel to questions from the audience. Now, I'd just like to give a very brief background to the importance of this panel. The state's economic and political successes are contingent upon the security conditions of that state. Without stability, social justice, economic development, and the working political system are difficult to attain. In countries where civil war, civilian uprisings, and international intervention have radically changed the status quo, citizens and military are now being challenged to create order out of chaos and establish political legitimacy. Libya and Egypt are two prominent examples of this phenomenon in North Africa. In Libya, the removal of Gaddafi from power has toppled all order. In Egypt, a military that is understood by some as repressive and by others as restoring order has proved to be a common player in the future of the country. The democratic, as democratic transitions transpire, questions of security sectors, legitimacy, relationship with government, and access to power are central, leading us to the following questions, among many others. As these volatile circumstances in Libya and Egypt, are, are they permanent or will they yield to a stable transition? Drawing from their own unique backgrounds, educations, and experiences, our panelists will tackle the subject speaking on the roles of civilians and military in times of transition. Now I'd like to introduce our first panelist, Dr. Schultz. Um, Dr. Schultz is a professor of international politics at Fletcher, at the Fletcher School, where he teaches graduate level courses in various aspects of international security affairs, internal to transnational conflict, war studies, and intelligence and armed groups. He is also the director of Fletcher School's International Security Program Studies Program. In Washington, he has served as director of research at the National Strategy Information Center, where in 2010 he completed a major study focusing on adapting America's security paradigm and security agenda to 21st century security challenges. He had also recently completed, with the assistance of the U.S. Marine Corps, an in-depth study analyzing the U.S. Marine Corps' 2004-2008 counterinsurgency campaign in Al Anbar province in Iraq. Dr. Schultz's most recent research is focused on developing the U.S. blueprint for security sector reform in the 21st century. The project works to first develop a framework for the U.S. that attempts that adopts SSR theory and practice for addressing dysfunctional security sectors of fragile states. Secondly, examines the state of capabilities across the U.S. government by addressing these challenges. And thirdly, identifies gaps in these capabilities that need to be filled if the U.S. is to employ SSR as an effective policy tool. Um, since the mid-1980s, Dr. Schultz has served as a security consultant for various U.S. government departments and agencies concerned with national security affairs. Currently, he is a consultant to the U.S. Special Operations Command in the U.S. Marine Corps. And with that, I'd like to open the floor to Dr. Uh, Richard Schultz. Thank you. What I thought I'd do is, um, is set the, the context for what um, security sector reform is and, um, and some of the challenges it faces. And, uh, and, and then um, we'll talk about Egypt. Libya. First, uh, first thing I would say is that the concept of security sector reform is a very new concept. Uh, it, um, it emerged uh, in the 1990s, and I'll, I'll say why. Uh, and, um, and, and, and when we think about security sector reform, uh, we are, we are um, talking about something that's much more than the military. So we're going to talk about the military, which is an important institution that needs reformed in, uh, in post-conflict and transition states, for sure. But the security sector 
um, the, 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 the statutory security sector includes military, police, intelligence agencies, and, um, and other um, uh, statutory organizations, security organizations, depending on the country. Uh, now, what they all have in common is that um, they provide security and they have a mandate from state authority to use force. So we call this the legitimate use of force. Um, but uh, the security sector is more than these statutory um, uh, uh, services. It also includes um, uh, uh, governmental agencies and uh, executive authority that supervises and has authority over the, the security sector. So we're, we're talking about a very big part of, uh, of, uh, of the government. Here we'll concentrate on the military. Now, where did this, uh, this concept come from? Um, the, if you will, uh, those who, who gave birth to it included the United Nations. Um, it includes um, the OECD, and the OECD has developed um, a handbook on security sector reform that I just uh, showed you there. Um, and, uh, and there were a couple of governments that uh, very much got involved in this idea, idea of developing a, a theory uh, for uh, security sector reform. And the most important one was, uh, was the United Kingdom. Uh, and, and they were really in the forefront of this. Now, what, what was driving this uh, the, the need or the, their, their, their belief that they needed this theory um, was the patterns of conflict in the 1990s. And so in the 1990s, um, the, the pattern of conflict uh, uh, was no longer, and it hadn't been for a while, but uh, it was uh, certainly not wars between states. Um, but what was shaping the, the conflict environment were what we would call intrastate conflicts, or, or conflicts between states and, uh, and non-state actors, and, and conflicts between states and their people. And, and so um, conflict began to be uh, examined as a people-centered environment. And, uh, and at this time, because these internal conflicts were quite awful, in terms of the human costs, um, the United Nations and other international actors began to um, get heavily involved in peacekeeping and peace operations. And if you remember, the 1990s had a great wave of peace operations, uh, much different than the earlier uh, the Cold War period. Now, of course, bringing uh, uh, conflict to uh, an end it's only the beginning. And so uh, the, the United Nations and the OECD and others began to focus on um, the post-conflict situation, uh, post-conflict re reconstruction and development, and, 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 and began to define security as human security, protecting individuals uh, and, uh, and, and, and guaranteeing their security. Now, the concept of human security helped the international community to better understand both the, the conditions that were causing this intrastate conflict and the security development integration that needed to take place uh, in the, the post-conflict period. And this led uh, to, um, to the concept of security sector reform. So the shift to human security fostered an approach to SSR, as it's called, based on, on the belief that in a post-conflict environment, security and development are interrelated, and it, it, you've got to get the security concepts right uh, if you're going to have sustainable power. And that was the theory, and this was developed especially um, by the OECD, the British Labour government, uh, and, uh, and, and then um, think tanks and so on. Now, in thinking about um, security sector reform in the late 1990s, um, the, the idea was that, um, that this would take place in two contexts. 
And we have both of them actually represented when we think about Libya and, uh, and Egypt. So the first context is a post-conflict state that has ex experienced extensive and violent disruption. And that would be Libya, that's for sure. That uh, context, that's one context. The other context is, is a, a state that has undergone a rather quick political transition following a short but um, uh, uh, powerful um, uh, civil resistance movement. And, and that would be Egypt. And, and I'm looking way in the back, we have one of the people who played a big role in that, uh, in Dalia Ziada, who's going to talk to us later. Um, so, security sector reform, I, I think of it as taking place in the gray zone uh, between the end of authoritarian rule, whether that authoritarian rule was, was forced out by uh, armed uh, opposition, that would be Libya, or by civil resistance. Um, the, this, in this gray zone, this gray zone is the end of authoritarian rule and the transition to rule of law based system, democratic system. Now the political circumstances and conditions in this gray zone, whether it's uh, Egypt or Libya as the two examples we have here, the, the, the political circumstances there will shape the art of the possible in security sector reform. Um, but, so security sector reform in either place um, addresses some common problems. And, and those common problems, of course, is that the security institutions in the old regime were re repressive institutions uh, that, um, that kept uh, the old uh, political leadership in power, whether they were uh, whether the, the, the key institutions were police or military or special this or special that. Uh, uh, these authoritarian regimes um, uh, create a lot of special, you know, special police, special paramilitary forces and so on. Many of those, by the way, in security sector reform have to go. Um, uh, we can talk about that in the discussion. Now, um, what, what's going to replace that? Well, the idea of security sector reform is that they will be replaced by effective, professional, and accountable uh, security services that operate under the rule of law. Now, this is a big change because the security institutions under the old regime didn't operate within the rule of law. They were the law, and, and they, they enforced their authority um, not in, uh, in, in a rule of law uh, context the way, way we think about it. So that's, that's sort of the, the big picture now, the challenge of military reform. So um, the military is really, uh, as I think about it, one of the three key uh, statutory uh, security institutions that lie at the heart of the reform process. And they also, these three institutions, military, police, and intelligence, they lie at the heart of the reform process, and they also were at the heart of the deep state. Okay? So you see the challenge here. These were key institutions in the deep state, and, and with all that that entails, and now you want them, as I said before, we're going to just define that you want them to be uh, under rule of law, accountable, etc. Um, huge challenge. Because now, in the case of the military, the military often constituted a key part of powerful security institutions that, um, that helped keep authoritarian regimes in power for decades. In, in North Africa and the Middle East, the military was, and in some cases still is, one of the enforcers of political power. And, and, and this can be seen, of course, in Syria today, and, and, and some other places. In the years leading up to um, the Arab Spring, militaries in the region 
um, were involved in politics. Um, and, and this was true uh, certainly in, in Egypt, uh, true in uh, Tunisia, um, and, 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 and elsewhere, as were these other institutions. Now, see, depending on the, 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 the state, um, some of these institutions were involved more than others, um, uh, but they all were involved. And, uh, and some of them, in addition to being involved in politics, are heavily involved in economy. So the, they, they also maintain, the military can maintain major corporate interests within the economy. And that's true, for example, in Egypt, the military, uh, as I'm sure you know, Karim uh, will say say, they have a, a, a big um, uh, place in the economy. So, um, the, the reform of military forces to, to change this dynamic as a key part of, of the transformation of the political system um, uh, is, uh, is at the heart of, uh, of the SSR process. Now, what is it that SSR wants to achieve? I, I'm going to just say something about some of the basics. And, uh, and, they, and then, um, and, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop. But um, democratic control of, of the military is based on a legal set of norms and standards that regulate civil military relationship. And, and how does it regulate it? it? It makes the military subordinate to elected authority and oversight. So. Just think about what a sea change this is in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in authoritarian regimes. In, in democratic, we call this the democratic control model. In the democratic control model of civil military relations, the armed services have to come to accept and to agree to a position of political neutrality that makes them accountable to civil authority. And, 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 and so civilians uh, who have legal authority will determine military expenditures. Well, in, in authoritarian states, the military budget is generally not known to civilians. So look at that. We want, the, the, we want military expenditures to be, and capabilities to be under the civilian control. We want the civilians uh, to um, formulate defense policy and even to maintain oversight of military activities and operations. So I see the, I see the uh, West Pointers uh, and uh, Naval Academy cadets sitting out there. This is uh, a given for them. This is what they're, 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 they're educated uh, right from the beginning to, uh, uh, to embrace. But militaries and authoritarian regimes, this is all new territory. So, and, and, and the civilians are going to derive their authority uh, to, uh, to exercise control through a, a framework of laws, policies, and regulations. Now, these laws, policies, and regulations also uh, have to constrain the civilian leadership. The civilian leadership can't think of the military as a tool for them to use. This structure uh, protects each. Civilians have authority over the military, gives them control of the military, but the military can't willy-nilly be used by, uh, by civilians. The law delineates the duties and protects the rights of armed services also. So in this democratic control model of the military, serves the interests of the state and of the, and the society and not the interests of a particular political clique or, or individual. To make this kind of change is demanding, it's tricky, and I think it's really, when I think about the two types of, um, of uh, context that we're going to talk about, you know, in, 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 in the case of, of Egypt, it's tricky because the military um, still exists and they have, they have uh, power uh, and influence. 
So how do you, you change that, that uh, military to one that, that uh, accepts this uh, SSR uh, theory? In the case of what Jean Louis is going to talk about, um, the, the, the Libya military is gone. But there are a whole bunch of militias there that now are uh, nominally uh, make up the military and the police. And that creates a whole other set of challenges. So achieving democratic control in such circumstances is demanding, it's tricky, especially in situations where military institutions remain intact. Therefore, when I think about this process, I, I think that this is a political process. You know, when you read these uh, manuals like this OECD uh, handbook on security sector reform, my goodness, uh, they tell you everything that, that, that you have to do and, and what it's supposed to look like when you get to the end. And it sounds all really good, but we're in a political process. And so the first step, I think, in this, and, and I'll, this, I'll make one other remark, but the way I think about this is the negotiation and, and mediation and a conciliation in which um, political leaders even in, 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 even in, as they have authority and they're, they're elected and so on, they have, have to undergo negotiations. And there is a, a political process and an evolution here that is not easy. And one of the things about the security sector reform literature and, and the, the history of security sector reform as a process since the late 90s is that there are very few cases of real success. And, and so, uh, when we talk about this, we have to understand that we're in new territory. Now, the final thing I, I want to say is that um, I see a real role for third parties in this. And, um, and as was mentioned, one of the things I'm doing with um, one of my uh, former doctoral students who's um, uh, at the U.S. Institute of Peace is thinking about what kind of capabilities the U.S. should have um, for, uh, for uh, playing a third party role in security sector reform, and, uh, and, and, and what the U.S. currently has in this area is really disorganized and disarray. And so we're trying to think through that. Uh, and, and, but I do think that third parties are very important in this process. So I'll stop with that. Thank you very much, Dr. Schultz. Next, we will hear from Kareem Haddad. Mr. Haddad is a career Egyptian uh, diplomat, currently serving as Deputy Director of the Policy Planning Division at the Egyptian Foreign Ministry in Cairo. Throughout his 20 year career as part of Egypt's Foreign Service, he has served in numerous capacities focusing on US Egyptian relations, Middle East uh, regional security, arms control and arms liberation, and Arab Israeli diplomacy. Before assuming his current position, Mr. Agad was a visiting professor at the Near East and South Asian Center for Strategic Studies in Washington, D.C., where he focused on the politics of the Arab Revolution and the security implications of the post-revolutionary transitions. From 2007 to 2011, Mr. Agad served as the director of the Egyptian Press and Information Office in Washington, D.C. From 2002 to 2007, he served in the office of the presidency in Cairo, responsible for U.S.-Egyptian relations and economic policy coordination. Prior to that, he was assigned to the political section of Egypt's embassy in Washington, where he was responsible for, for political uh, military affairs in the Middle East peace process. On behalf of EPIC and, and the IGA, I'd like to thank Mr. God for aiding our students who have traveled to Egypt this past winter and for his contributions to the colloquium. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank um, Sherman especially for his kind invitation to include me uh, in the colloquium and on this very important panel. Um, so I think Dick did a, all, us, uh, all of us a huge favor by unpacking what is a very complex um, discipline, the, the, the discipline of security sector reform as it emerged uh, after the Cold War. Um, what, what I thought I'd like to do is 
see how it looks from the receiving end. So from the regional point of view, the key question I would like to ask is, why is it when we begin to apply the concepts and principles that, that Dick uh, laid out for us in the regional context, why is SSR so challenging? I mean, it will probably be, it continue to be so challenging. I think that the main point I take away from his presentation is this is an exceedingly difficult endeavor. Um, it is hard, it is complex, it takes time. If we look at the historical context of security sector reform, and I think he's absolutely right in pointing out, there are very few success stories uh, that we can look to. And those few success stories that we have take time, take a better part of 10 years or more, whether we look in the Latin American context, Central and Eastern Europe, East Asia, uh, or elsewhere. So if, if we look at, at the region, why is security sector reform such a, a challenge? First of all, as Dick mentioned, the security sector has been an integral component of the power structure in the region. Many, well, most of the regimes uh, in the region have been built on very powerful security institutions. However, this manifests itself in different ways, and I think the, Dick alluded to this, and I think our, our next speakers will also touch upon this. In Egypt and Tunisia, for example, you had security institutions that developed a very high level of institutional identity. And the key here is it was an institutional identity that was actually separate from the regime. Whereas in countries like Libya, for example, you had these two things fused together. The security sector, or in this case the military, and the regime were actually one and the same thing. This is why when you have the collapse of an authoritarian regime in Libya, the military collapses with it. And so you have a situation in Egypt, for example, where there is a popular uprising. The military can actually make a decision not only to not fire on protesters in Tahrir Square, but also eventually move to depose the existing regime. It's inconceivable that something like that would happen in Libya, precisely because of the reality that the regime and the security sector are fused together. And in other instances where you see this, you find that the security sector becomes sectarianized, as we've seen in Syria, or balkanized or fragmented, as we've seen uh, in Yemen. So we have very different contexts when we talk about the security sector in the region. The political context is also very challenging. I mean, the key attribute, as many of you would appreciate, of the Arab revolutions in general is that they emerged without any distinctive leadership. And if we go back and, and try and trace the evolution of the uprisings in Egypt and Tunisia, we find that precisely because there was no space for formal politics, politics began to emerge or migrate into informal channels in the media, in cyberspace, and eventually on the street. So what we ended up with was a mass of people in Tahrir Square, but no leadership, no political parties, no Nelson Mandela's, no Lev Valenza's. Now, where that presents a challenge for security sector reform is it leaves us with a situation in which the military becomes the only credible organized force to actually oversee the transition. But more importantly, there is no civilian leadership to actually negotiate with the military on the basics of the transition or even before we get to the issue of security sector reform. So when Dick says that security sector reform is all about negotiations, there really is nobody to negotiate with at, at present, at least. There is no elite in the region that's been exposed to the concepts and the practice of security sector reform uh, that, that Dick made. So the political context is also quite challenging. The regional context is probably more challenging than all of the other issues uh, I mentioned. Now, especially in the Middle East, because we have a situation 
or religion security context that is characterized by chronic instability based on existential conflict. Now, the region, the Middle East, of course, is not unique in this sense. We've had conflict settings, as I'm sure our speakers uh, will outline, in other regions. But the Middle East seems to be particularly prone to this type of chronic conflict. And what we've seen in the course of the Arab uprisings is that the revolutions themselves have been regionalized. And we see this, for example, in Syria. So what happens in Syria is not just about Syria. It's about the broader Sunni-Shiite conflict. And overlaid on top of that is the broader Saudi-Iranian competition for geopolitical influence, which is an extension of the competition in the Gulf. Now, you contrast that, for example, with other regional or international settings of security sector reform experiences. So Eastern and Central Europe, for example you have a much more conducive or enabling environment for one of the few success stories we've had in successful uh, security sector uh, reform. We had the context of NATO, or at least the aspirations of these countries to join NATO, and eventually beyond that, the European Union. Very different from the regional context we see prevailing uh, in the region. Now, given that, I want to talk a little bit uh, about uh, Egypt, because Egypt, uh, I think, is a special case, given the background uh, I've laid out. So, obviously, the military has been a key player in the revolution in Egypt, as it has unfolded over the last three years. And now we're seeing, of course, the prospect of one of the officer corps assuming or putting forward his candidacy for the office of the president in the person of the defense minister of Fatah and Sisi. Now, people see this, and I think jump to the conventional wisdom, that Egypt is reverting back to some form of military dictatorship, either some variation of the free officer's regime, what we had a, a, a military man as president in the form of Kamal Abdel Nasser, or some form of semi-authoritarian system as it has existed over the course of the last 30 years under a former President Mubarak. I would argue that the challenge in Egypt is different. The challenge in Egypt is not one of defining the role of the military in civilian politics. The challenge really is one of defining the role of civilian politics in the military sphere. And here, I think what we're seeing is a much more complex picture that is evolving and I think will evolve over the course uh, of the next few years. So very quickly, to recap, the last three years have been difficult ones for the military, or challenging ones for the military. I think the military came away from this experience with two key assumptions that were reinforced by their intervention in Egyptian politics. On the one hand, if you recall, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, or the SCAF, which is the highest leadership body in the Egyptian military, assumed direct control of the transition in the post-Mubarak phase. So President Mubarak, former President Mubarak, resigned, handed power to the SCAF, and this gap was in charge of the course of the transition over the next 18 months. That was a very difficult transition for the military to oversee. And I think by all objective accounts, it did not go well. The military saw its popularity that peaked because of their intervention in Tahrir Square not to fire on the protesters. That gained the military enormous popularity. But the military went from the high point at the beginning of 2011 to, in 18 months' time, because of the twists and turns of the post mubarak transition, to facing very angry protesters coming back to Tahrir Square, calling for the downfall of military rule. Now, this was unprecedented for the Egyptian military as a national institution that claims a role or prides itself in its popularity amongst Egyptian public opinion. 
So on the one hand, it re that whole experience, that Syrian experience, reinforced the reluctance of the military to become involved in uh, civilian politics. On the other hand, the military's decision to hand over power to former President Morsi in the summer of 2013 was a historic watershed. I mean, this was the first time that an elected civilian president assumes office uh, in Egypt uh, through free and fair elections. It was also the first time that a member of the Muslim Brotherhood assumes power through free elections in any Arab country. So this was a historic moment. Now, the assumption or the expectation on the part of the military and for the, the broad majority of Egyptians was that this would set the stage for a stable situation of civilian politics. That Morsi and the Brotherhood would act as responsible actors. Now, obviously, the situation proved to be very different, and it forced the military to intervene again after a year followed by massive protesters that dwarfed anything we've seen in 2011. So the military came away from that experience realizing or reinforcing its mistrust of civilian politics, especially in the realm of national security. It didn't change their reluctance to get involved in civilian politics, but it reinforced their inclination to carve out a space for them to protect their autonomy and their uh, decision-making away from civilian politics. Now, if we see what happened over the course uh, of the post-Morsi transition, we find a very interesting dynamic. The military handed over power to a civilian authority to manage the second transition, the post-Morsi transition, in the person of the head of the Supreme Constitutional Court, the highest judicial body uh, in Egypt. And so it set the stage for what I think will be a very interesting evolution in civil-military relations in Egypt. So back to the original question. What can we expect in the future course of how the military and civilian leadership will interact in Egypt? Will we return to some form of military dictatorship? I argue not. And for three reasons. The political context. Three years, two revolutions, two presidents that have been ousted, both of whom face criminal prosecution. The changeover of no less than six governments over the course of the last three years. A new generation, a new youth demographic in Egypt. 60% of Egyptians are under the age of 40 years. This is a generation that is extremely politicized and increasingly globalized. Given all that, I think it will be extremely difficult for the military to even attempt to go back to the status quo uh, ante. Now, when we talk about the political context, a lot, of, well, a lot will depend on the ability of civilians to ensure that they form a stable system of civilian politics and civilian leadership that can eventually negotiate with the military for a new equilibrium in civil-military relations in Egypt. So that's the first point. The politics in Egypt has changed. I think the military as an institution has also changed. Since the Arab-Israeli wars, we've seen two trends in the Egyptian military. We've seen the depoliticization of the military. This is a military that has intervened in politics, but has done so extremely reluctantly, only during times of national emergency. And we've seen the demilitarization of the regime. So there is no precedent over the course of the last 30 years for direct military rule uh, in Egypt. In 1952, when the free officers uh, took power overthrowing the monarchy in Egypt, the free officers constituted what was a secret junta. It was a secret movement within the armed forces. Since then, we've seen the professionalization of the Egyptian military as a much more institutionalized, cohesive body. And we've seen the emergence of a new generation of the officer corps, which is much more professional, much more globally exposed. We have Egyptian officers 
transitioning through institutions affiliated with the U.S. military all the time. And I think that constitutes a critical mass of the officer corps that will shape the outlook of the military uh, as we move forward. Now, the third point, the last point I want to talk about is the constitutional framework for civil military relations uh, in Egypt. Now, people point to very specific clauses in the new constitution that was ratified early this year uh, in Egypt that shield the military from civilian oversight. This is true, but it's only partly true. We see, for example, that the President of the Republic is the supreme commander of the armed forces. The budget of the military is not made public. That, that is certainly correct. However, it is discussed within specialized committees with the President presiding and with the attendance of members of parliament responsible for the budget and for national uh, defense issues. And we've seen a very elaborate system of checks and balances for issues like, or very critical decisions like, the declaration of war. Neither the civilian leadership nor the military on its own have the prerogative of declaring war or even declaring a state of emergency. Now, the military introduced or insisted on these clauses precisely because they recognized that they would have to hand over power to the civilian leadership sooner or later, and in this case it turned out to be sooner, but precisely because they knew that civilians were eventually going to be in charge, that they wanted to carve out this enclave to protect uh, their autonomy in terms of budgets and decision making. But as I said, that autonomy is not absolute, and it's not complete. We've seen in the debate over the Constitution a certain amount of very significant pushback by civilians uh, when negotiating with the military. So there was, in that sense, a negotiation there. For example, the clause that states that it is the military's prerogative to select the defense minister now, the pushback came when the civilians insisted that that only be for two presidential terms. So there was an implicit recognition that this situation would not be enduring and that it would only be temporary, going back to a new model of civil-military relationship that would have to be uh, negotiated. Finally, when looking at the Constitution, there's one very important thing you don't see. You don't see what I call a protection of the nation clause. So if you look at the Turkish constitution, the Algerian constitution, or the Pakistani constitution, there is a clause that guarantees for the military some role in the political sphere. We don't have that in Egypt. The mandate of the armed forces is very specifically tied to the issue of defense. And I think it goes back and reinforces the reluctance or reflects the reluctance of the military to get involved in civilian politics uh, 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 once again. So as a result of this, what will we see? I think we will see a situation that is evolving in terms of the relationship between the civilian authorities and the military. It will depend on the changing political context, the changing security context, but I think there's a basis to renegotiate what will be an evolving civilian-military relationship as we move forward. Thank you. All right. Uh, next, we'll hear from Mr. Jean-Louis Romine. Um, Mr. Romine is a doctoral uh, researcher at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. His core focus is the role of civil society and local governance in the democratic transition. Before undertaking his doctoral studies, Jean-Louis uh, was an Air Force pilot and instructor in the Italian Air Force. He has conducted research and humanitarian work in several African countries, including Guinea, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Mali. Additionally, Jean-Louis has conducted research and worked in Libya from, from November 2011 until December 2013. His activities focused on civil society, governance, and security. He has been leading such work for ACTD, USIP, Global Integrity, UNICEF, and UNDP. Most recently, Jean-Louis was part of a research team focusing on security sector reform and disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration in Libya. Their task was to provide recommendations 
to the U.S. State Department are the avenues to support peace and stability in Libya. Mr. Omine is currently lecturing a course in Libya at Tufts University. Additionally, on behalf of myself and my classmates, I'd like to personally thank Jeremy for including us in his doctoral work on designing a good and survey in Libya. Thank you.
There was one tier that was uh, um, the nominal uh, a classical army, if you will, um, counting about 75,000 uh, people. And um, they had uh, not really a, a clear role. Uh, internally, they were supposed to defend the country from external aggression. Um, parallel to this, the real uh, power was in the hands of revolutionary forces, all those special brigades that the President Schultz pointed to. There was a variety of them. Um, the most um, brutal and uh, uh, the strongest was the revolutionary committees, uh, which were providing internal security. They were very well equipped, much better equipped than the army. Uh, they didn't really have any legislation uh, that established them. Um, and they were uh, solely uh, just created for the protection of the regime and of the uh, person of the death. And this uh, force was pretty much the same size as the actual army. And uh, not only that, but they were contingents, they were actually revolutionary guards inside all the arms, uh, armed forces, overseeing and indoctrinating and reporting on any deviation. So, um, on the um, broad uh, depiction of the military in Libya until uh, the death was imposed, you could say that there was no rule of law, no formal rules. Um, there was no military, uh, no ministry of defense, by the way, in Libya. Uh, rank didn't necessarily equate with the real influence of an officer. A captain could be much more influent than a colonel. Uh, depending on his uh, ties. Uh, there was no horizontal relationship between uh, different arms. Uh, border guards uh, couldn't interact with the Air Force or the Army. Uh, and there was a force to prevent uh, coup, to prevent any sort of uh, young officer like Daffy talking him. There was also a large use of foreign forces. Gaddafi actually had a battalion uh, of foreign fighters, and he used foreign fighters also during the revolution. And uh, another important trait is that um, Gaddafi forces, especially the revolutionary forces, were willing to use maximum force against the population, and they did. In terms of uh, civilian uh, leadership, uh, the same uh, reality existed, uh, maybe even more hypocritical, because it was supposed to be a direct democracy, a true socialism, the Jamahiriya uh, rule of people. In reality, uh, power was behind the scenes and had a very small elite uh, surrounding Gaddafi, uh, made up of his family and close relatives and trusted people. And um, they were making all the decisions, but in reality, uh, that was hidden behind a uh, structure that was uh, just a facade, uh, revolutionary uh, people's uh, committees and people congresses uh, that were supposed to actually uh, make decisions. So, this is just a picture of uh, Libya until the revolution. Um, if you uh, look uh, at uh, the traits of military instruments and security forces, uh, and uh, the likelihood that they uh, would uh, defend or attack the population during the revolution, uh, better scholars than me uh, have actually found uh, a correlation, direct correlation, on the degree to which uh, these uh, security forces were institutionalized, uh, the degree to which they had set rules um, and uh, meritocratic principles for advancement and the likelihood that they would actually use force against the people. And if you think about it, it makes sense. Because if my promotion and my career depends on my ties to the regime, uh, I have no interest in defending the regime. Uh, but if the rules are written and there is meritocracy, uh, I have a certain degree of autonomy uh, in my prospects and careers, and I can shift my uh, allegiance, and uh, I can shift culturally, I mean, cognitively, uh, my role to defending the people rather than defending the regime uh, that uh, I'm serving. Uh, the other aspect uh, is the relationship between the uh, civilians and the military. Uh, and by this I mean either um, conscripted, uh, conscription, the presence of conscription, uh, or professionalized uh, army, 
um, and the proximity of soldiers to the population uh, in which they operate. Uh, of course, the closer they are, the less likely they are to use weapons against people that could be uh, their cousins. So, can we do security sector reform and uh, DDR? Because uh, also, uh, disarmament, democratization, and uh, reintegration is largely a requirement to possibly do security sector reform uh, in India. Well, let me give you that there is no possibility to do traditional security sector reform, nor DDR right now in India. And I said that the State Department, where we're at, um, we're going to have to think outside the box. Now, why? Um, the military right now um, has uh, about 100,000 members. Um, by the way, 20% of those are uh, officers, half of which are either generals or colonels. Uh, imagine a company, a large company, and uh, one out of five is either CEO or director. It doesn't quite work. Parallel to this, uh, there are a series of militias that have been uh, given some sort of legitimacy to operate. We call them quasi-state militias. And they operate on behalf of the Ministry of Defense. They're called Lydia Shield, and there are 12 brigades, although some of them have been uh, kicked out. Lydia Shield 3 in Benghazi uh, has been kicked out uh, by the population, not by the state, because they were committing abuse. Uh, this, uh, lovely group of militias operating under the name of India Shield um, vary in the degree of uh, uh, legitimacy and the uh, role that they play. Uh, but let me just say that uh, they have been repressing minorities in the south of India, the Tugus, uh, or the Tuaregs. So they have been used instrumentally by some uh, powers in the state and maybe <coughs> some tribes. Uh, for their own personal interests. Uh, another role that they played, they uh, advocated for the political isolation law, basically kick out all uh, <coughs> the politicians that were working one way or another under Gaddafi. And uh, that was used as a political weapon by the parties to cut the leadership of the party. And again, these the shield brigades were used uh, against the ministries taking siege and uh, trying to force the decision that was favorable to them. They eventually succeeded. Uh, activists were confronting them. Again, the state was powerless. On the other side, there is the police. Uh, again, about 100,000 people. Um, and uh, if you count, uh, it's probably the highest per capita uh, concentration of police uh, in the world. Uh, but eventually, they're not in the street. Uh, they are on payroll, but they are not work working. Parallel to this, an equal number of militias again given a mandate to operate on the name of Security Sector Committee, uh, Supreme Security Committee, sorry. Um, and they also uh, committed abuses. They were present uh, during the destruction of Sufi shrines by Islamists. And uh, that's just to give you an idea of how reliable and how much they follow uh, government orders. So, um, I will uh, go on a limb and try to answer uh, the question, what we can do, um, and uh, what we can do to help, and what they can do uh, to solve this, uh, uh, this big problem. Well, I think that there should be two uh, processes, one at the national level and one at the local level. The one at the local level in the immediate uh, future is the most important one. Now, uh, to succeed in security sector reform, uh, you need to have political will, and you need to have the ability to deliver. India lacks both. It lacks the political will. Uh, there is no intent yet at the political level of the elites to actually build the army, build the security forces. Um, so that there must be a national dialogue that potentially will lead uh, to a broker agreement uh, and, and that uh, will have to. Uh, I will be brief. <laughs> and that will have to come first. We will have to agree on the degree of centralization or decentralization, on the role of religion, on the role of minorities and the rights of minorities. 
and uh, the management of all resources. Until they agree on that, no political agreement. If no political agreement, no state building endeavor. At the local level, that's where I think the action should take place right now. Um, and uh, we should try and uh, help um, frame a process that is already ongoing, de facto. Uh, militias are playing a role. They are the ones that are providing security, either on behalf of the state or individually, or connected to some uh, tribal leaders. Uh, we need to try and harness that, and at the same time, build the presence of the state at the local level. First of all, we should sustain uh, the efforts of uh, municipal uh, administration and support municipal councils, which have just been elected almost all over the country. Uh, we should see a development of local uh, communication platforms for the uh, council to be able to communicate with the constituency and vice versa to be more responsive, responsive to them, but also to create a platform for communication and dialogue at the local level. We should empower civil society and uh, in a way that civil society will uh, extend the ability to deliver of the local councils because they are experienced and uh, it's going to be very hard at the beginning. Civil society can play a big role in uh, forging dialogue because they are the brothers and sisters and fathers of the actual militia members. And finally, uh, we need to accept to create some uh, hybrid arrangements, hybrid security arrangements, by creating some operation room, possibly under uh, civilian oversight of local councils, uh, for these militias uh, to uh, provide security. Uh, it's not uh, ideal, it's very dangerous, uh, but at least to harness a process that is already ongoing and try to provide a framework and also try to give them some legal uh, oversight, some legal uh, procedures by putting in the loop judges and prosecutors. So I think that uh, over time, I'll be delighted to answer some questions. Right, now I'd like to introduce our last speaker before the student presentations, uh, Dr. Ibrahim al Um It is an honor to introduce him. Uh, Dr. al Ghazali was born in Egypt in July of 1964 and graduated from the University of College in 1985. He has energy and specialized uh, studies in public law and international law system. Upon completion of his academic studies, he was appointed as an instructor to police cadets since 1988, he has been a course lecturer for his cadets in the field of international law. In 2007, he completed his PhD in international law at Ayn Shams University in Cairo, writing The Rights of the Child in International Law. In 2010, he obtained the U.S. Army War College Peacekeeping, Peacekeeping and Civilian Operations Institute, PKSOI, Fellowship on Rule of Law. In July 2012, he voluntarily left official government work to focus on professional training in Egypt and abroad. Over his 25 years of public service expertise, Dr. Ogazawi's uh, work covered legal studies, human rights, the rule of law, lays on duties with political and tribal powers, conflict analysis resolution, among many other focuses. He has also served in over 15 years as an instructor and evaluator in peacekeeping, police and legal reforms, civilian operations, and planning, and planning, and has served as an evaluation specialist in the field of crime fighting and justice management. In addition to being a PKSOI fellow, he is currently a Humphrey Fellow and Lecturer of Human Rights and International Law. With that, I'd like to open the floor to Dr. Adrian Thomas. Well, Dr. Ibrahim Ghazawi and Colonel Ibrahim Ghazawi, that caused me a lot of problems in the last few days. <laughs> in the last few days, I have to be some time, you know, and, and entering the Boston airport, the officer was suspicious because in my passport it says I'm a colonel, and uh, the invitation says doctor, so he said, which person you are from the side? So I told him, I'm both of them. <laughs> and it took me like like 20 minutes to convince him that I'm both of them. Then he asked a few questions to make sure that I was really a police officer, and I thank God because he didn't know much about international law, otherwise it would have been double time. <laughs> Um, well, I, 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 will, I will start with this, uh, with this uh, uh, statement of, 
of uh, famous economists. I mean, uh, telling that a legal system, efficient legal system, is not a luxury. It's a, um, a must gate for any community who would like to get involved and get moved to forward. Um, then I will um, I will go through a few um, circles of of influence. I'm trying to be more, a little bit more than understanding exactly what, what the security sector reforms is because my ex-speakers were uh, so eloquently covering this issue, so I'll be a little bit more keen to make um, you know uh, make it easier trying to fit these concepts into the, the wider frames of stability, of transition, of threats that could hit any community and what are the limits, what could happen when this circles are not working together in harmony. I will start with uh, this power monopoly, and this is uh, uh, an inestable community should have power monopoly over military and police. If this power monopoly is not there, then you don't have a state. Then you could have Bosnia, you could have Somalia, and, and Iraq, and Libya, because the state will not be able to impose its orders. Of course, power monopoly is very much linked to stability and human rights. If the country is not in, in, in control of the power, then you cannot talk much about human rights. And that reminds me of what Kofi Annan said once in, in, in one of his speeches, that uh, human rights is the first victim of armed conflicts. The rule of law, of course, very much linked to this, and the power monopoly will enable the, the, the state to impose the rule of law over everyone and every group in the society. Um, and the interest conflict is just a humanitarian um, trade. I mean, always there is conflict interesting every moment. But the idea is the country is, is the official body of the state able to resolve this conflict in a good way. If it is it, yes, then it means there is power monopoly and there is rule of law. If they cannot manage to resolve this conflict peacefully, and legally and in a fair way, then they plunge immediately into armed conflicts and then we'll talk about armed conflicts covering major crimes like human trafficking, drug trafficking, and organized crimes, and etc. etc. So uh, when I talk about conflict of interest, what if they didn't uh, they don't come along? If the partners in the community are not able to reach solutions, we will have a country like Bosnia, and I worked in Bosnia for some time in previous, even some long years before Bosnia, I was in South Africa, in Namibia, and as part of the UN peacekeeping mission, controlling the transition period there. And Bosnia was, was very dramatic, exactly, uh, embodying what, what you could ever say about uh, what would happen when human beings lose their minds. Um, what sometimes, as, as you say in English, for uh, proverb, uh, sometimes picture speaks uh, much louder than words. Or, or is it more than a thousand words? <laughs> Professor Shaman? <laughs> okay. This is Mustar Bridge, one of the famous uh, places uh, in Islamic, uh, Turkish, actually Turkish places in Bosnia and Mustar. That was before the war. And that's what happened when the war started in, in, in this area in Mustafa. Um, of course, I, I, I was very much enthusiastic to bring a picture which is not so much uh, aggressive, but okay, I tried my best. But I'm sorry if that picture will hit some feelings for the audience, but it's okay. I mean, we have to understand that the rule of law circles, when, when they are mismanaged, they, they could drive the whole country into a disastrous situation where they could spend more, more than years and years trying to, to get out in vain. This picture was uh, six years after the Bosnia war ended, and I took it myself, this one and this one, but this one, of course, I didn't take it. <laughs> and it says exactly what happened. I mean, I mean, yes, it, when, the, when the army conflict starts, there is no law, and I'm not talking about uh, human rights. Rights. You cannot talk about economy or, 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 or development or anything else. Uh, one of the major things that happen when, when armed conflict starts is human trafficking, and I don't want to go a lot of, I spend a lot of time with this because time is already limited, but then I'll go to the revolution 
in Egypt, I will try to make like snap of good shots from different scenes of, of, of these issues, so that, you know, trying to cover as much as possible from the topics in this limited time. In Egypt, the police is really, uh, was uh, before the revolution, one, one of the major reasons for this revolution. And I was part of the police as, as I was introduced at the beginning. So I knew exactly that we had a lot of things to talk about in terms of the police professionalism and the attitude in Egypt in the time before the revolution, and still so far. So uh, yes, there is a real need for the police to, to be reformed. But I have to say also that one of the, the positive things that I could talk about about the police in Egypt and is that the police is not weak. The police is very strong. And the police is united, it's unified, it's not fragmented into small groups or militias or whatever. But this is what Karim said at the beginning. What makes Egypt very characteristic in terms of you know, the, the institutions of the rule of law, yes, there is a real need for reforms, but they are still very strong and very united and well structured. Um, that, oh, actually, um, if you get back a little bit to, uh, to the time of the revolution, only it happened in two days, in 28th and 29th of January, when the police was totally disappearing from, from the scene in Egypt, only for 48 hours after it was heavily attacked and 600 police stations were burnt down, and over 2,500 police vehicles were burnt down, and like 150 court buildings also were totally demolished. And that was actually a, a very revealing message about who is doing that. Is it a real revolution, or, or is it somebody who would like to turn or to demolish this country? Because if you target the police and justice, what else will be left? So uh, I move one, one step forward. Uh, I'm talking about transition now, transition period. And I don't know, there was supposed to be a previous one before this. I uh, hope it's still there. No, miss okay, it's here. Okay. This one is indicative about the, the relative size of you know, ministries or, or uh, the official players in the scene, the government, in normal times. Where you have military, you have health, you have economy, um, uh, they have the parliament, you have judiciary, police, education, etc. etc. The, the sizes are very much related to each other without you know, a huge size given to a particular entity or another. But during transition, the situation is totally or diametrically different because you will see in reality this is happening. And uh, it, this happens in Egypt, it happens in Iraq, it happens in, in South Africa, in Bosnia, in every country in transition. There is um, an imperative need to focus more on the rule of law circles. In, in this picture, we will find the military in a very large circle. We will find police also, a very large circle. And sometimes judiciary, which is very positive, because judiciary, if it is like in Egypt case, if it is large like that, it means that the, the, represent, the, the, the professional representative or representation of justice is still functioning. In other countries, it wasn't the, the case, because in many other countries, like emergency law were declared or martial laws, and then there were no normal laws controlling. And even in Egypt, fortunately, uh, nobody listened to this cause at a at, at particular stage or after the revolution. A lot of people were calling for emergency, for martial laws, for, for you know, just setting aside the normal uh, uh, laws and resort to more strict or more stringent laws. But it's still, luckily, in Egypt, judiciary is fully functioning according to the normal civilian laws. Um, well, back to the police, when I talk about security sector reforms, because this, it has something to do with what happened to some extent in 25th uh, January in Egypt, when people, uh, a lot of the demonstrations uh, targeted the police. And, uh, well, uh, yes, of course, probably the police uh, had uh, a lot of things, that, you know, in, in the relation between the police and the community, but it doesn't mean that if you are angry with the police to go and destroy the buildings and burn and, and, and steal the weapons and, and turn everything upside down. 
So this is the, the demolition for building theory. That we destroy everything and, and, and build from scratch. And this is it's, it's very awkward and very wrong theory. If you apply this in, in rule of law circles, it means that you are destroying the community. Uh, talking about the military and its relation with the police, in, in transition times, it's really critical and sensitive and imperative. It's not a choice. Actually, they must work together. In, in most of the cases, the police uh, is faced with huge challenges in, that, that, he, that they cannot cover themselves in terms of the tools, in terms of equipment, weapons, in terms of even the personnel and their structure, and in terms also of being efficient in different geographical areas where it could be harsher than the, the places that the police could normally function in. So the relation between the police and military was a must at this particular phase. And luckily, it went in a very good shape. And let me tell you honestly, even before the revolution, the 25th century, the first revolution in 25th, the police relation with the military was not so that warm. You know. Officially, it was very warm, but in, internally, I know that it wasn't that good. Now it's really very good, and, and, and they are joining hands together. But the, the issue of the military with the police is, when you talk about reforms, you are main, main, more or less talking about the same main lines. Uh, the, the challenges are the same, but they are different in terms of the scope and the depth of such lines. Okay? Put being politicized, or corruption, or rule of law, or training, or etc., etc. So, I, I will get back to what, what um, um, uh, our speakers covered quickly, or touched gently on, about the accountability. Because this is really exactly what should happen after probably a few, few years from now. And as Karim said and Professor Schultz, this uh, the process takes a long time. When you talk about security sector reforms, you are talking about the time span of at least five years. In, in Indonesia, they, they started their police reforms from 1998, and still the project is, is going until now, we are in 2014. It means that. There is short-term uh, steps that has, be to, has to be taken, and medium-term plans, and also long-term plan, but it has to stop. Um, after, uh, after 30 June's revolution, and this picture I would like to uh, comment about, because a lot of people in Egypt saw this as a positive sign of the police returning to the community, while we, uh, probably well, Professor Schultz also will agree with me, we see this as not professional scene of a police officer because police officers should not work in, in a way that give the impression that, that they are with or against this particular group of people in the community. They just apply the law with blind eyes. But we also we have to say, and this is it's good to say before I conclude my, my presentation, that police in Egypt, with military, uh, they are facing huge challenges of irresponsible behaviors from a lot of people in the streets. And all of a sudden, most of the Egyptian uh, accumulated history, historically accumulated problems, came out all of a sudden in the streets in a huge avalanche of violations of law every moment in the streets of Egypt. And the police found themselves have to face everything from early morning until late in the night, which is pose a great challenge in front of them. Uh, also, the, the, uh, the fingers of terrorist activities start to jump in the scene by destroying some uh, military and police stations again and killing officers and soldiers in the last couple of months. More than 12 or 13 terrorism activities have taken place. So I will conclude with, with uh, this one. The, 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 uh, the, the partners of change in Egypt or anywhere in the country, in the world, where we would like to make security sector reforms, it's, it should not only focus on security in itself. It should be go a little bit farther and upper of the security uh, operators and work as a kind of socially orchestrated and covering a lot of you know, threats of the equation at the very same time. 
talking about the state itself and parliament, society, and civil society, and the Minister of Interior is, is one factor of, of the reform process, and it has to go on a parallel lines together, as I said, on, on through le three levels of plans, short, medium, and long plans, and it has to be also very careful not to mess around with the, 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 uh, the, the constant uh, basis of the police, or judiciary, or military, because this is not a time to mess around with such sensitive, sensitive bodies of, uh, of the state during transitional period. I will conclude with a few words to tell that the, the, there is real need for uh, police reforms and, and security sector reforms in, in, in every country in the world, whether it's from the first line countries or, or third world countries, it's always there. But during transitional period, even the need is more sensitive and, need, uh, and, and had to be done in a much more articulated and planned and visioned way uh, not to risk the stability of the community and not to add a new member of the case and violence club in the Middle East like Iraq and Libya and Syria. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, next we'll be hearing from our student presenters. Um, we have about half an hour left for this panel, so we'll try to make them <laughs> as quickly as possible so we can get some questions in. Let me just quickly, oh sorry. Okay, the, there you go. Um, let me just quickly introduce the producers, or, uh, presenters. Um, first we have Sarah Butterfield, she's a senior from Connecticut, majoring in international relations with a concentration in international security. Having developed a strong interest in the MENA region at a young age, she spent her junior year studying abroad at the American University in Cairo, focusing on political Islamic movements and developing her Arabic skills. She hopes to return to Egypt in the future to pursue her interest in the ever-evolving world of Egyptian politics. This winter break, Sarah researched the evolving world of religion and governance in Egypt and how perceptions of their relationship were affected by the summer 2013 uprisings. And our other presenter is Isabel Wiener, uh, who is a senior majoring in international relations and Arabic. She studied in Alexandria, Egypt, uh, last spring to Cairo for the summer to intern research public health in Egypt. This past winter, Isabel researched civil society and popular perceptions after the events of June and July 2013. And I'd like um, to give a warm welcome to our presenters, uh, Isabel and Sarah. and 
religious beliefs only came secondary as political motivations to what was really a desire for basic economic change and economic stability. And that was the key political motivator in the shifts in power that have happened over the past few years rather than these other motivations. Um, as I said earlier, I specifically focused on religion and how um, political Islamic groups and political Islamic thought played a role. In Egypt, uh, religious, religion is a very deep-rooted part of the infrastructure. For example, um, the institution of Al-Azhar, which is the highest religious authority in Egypt, is still regularly consulted on legal issues, and that continues to be a part of the constitution. And I also looked at uh, the new constitution that it since 1971, the Constitution has had an article that includes um, Sharia as the main source of legislation for the state of Egypt. That remains in the Constitution today. And one of the people that we spoke to who worked on the new draft of the Constitution actually told us that this article was one of the least controversial in any article that they published, which says a lot about the role, how deep religion is rooted in the governing structure, and how little of an influence the downfall of the Muslim Brotherhood actually had on people's desire for religion to be part of their government. That being said, we actually weren't able to speak to anyone that was involved with the Muslim Brotherhood, so there's certainly a really important perspective that's missing from this. So there are people who still believe that the Muslim Brotherhood is making a difference. And so when the Muslim Brotherhood and Morsi failed to deliver on the basic demands of the people, we saw the evolution of the Tamari petition. Um, and as I said, I originally thought that Tamari was viewed as a movement towards democracy, but once I spoke to people and interviewed them, I found out that most people in fact viewed Tamari as simply a petition that its main goal was to oust Morsi and reinstate the initial basic demands of the people that were largely economic. Um, and when it comes to this petition, there are many issues of legitimacy surrounding it. So when you talk about this petition in the West, the Western discourse largely revolves around definitions, such as what is an Islamist, what is a military coup, is the petition legitimate in any way? And I found that to be a very different set of discourse that went on in Egypt. The Egyptian discourse revolved largely around whether the government was effective at all, not focusing on these definitions. And as I said earlier, the Tamari petition aimed to collect 15 million signatures and then reported that they collected 22 million. These signatures were never counted by an official legislative body of any kind. So I asked Dr. Dewey, why do you believe this number, this 22 million? Because it seems that everyone accepted that that was in fact the number of signatures that were collected. And the common response was that Morsi had departed from the realm of legitimacy long ago. So, I think that legitimacy is pretty much synonymous with effectiveness in Egypt right now, and that definition may change over time, but right now it's important to notice the difference between <coughs> Egyptian discourse on the ground and the Western discourse we experience here. Since we've left Egypt, the situation, even though it was only a month ago, had actually changed dramatically. The, we left right before the constitutional referendum, and since then the constitution has passed with a 98% approval rate, and the Supreme Constitutional Court declared that if um, CC runs for president, his candidacy is legal. So according to most people that we met with, that has now become a foregone conclusion that CC will run for presidency and if he does, will win. And this further um, speaks to the thesis that we were talking about earlier, that people's main requirements right now are that their basic economic needs and economic stability is being met rather than moving towards a democratic transition, because stability right now for them is the most important. And this presentation isn't to say that Egyptians won't strive towards democracy in the future, but rather that they're prioritizing these basic economic needs right now over a democratic transition. And until these basic needs are met, we will continue to see them being a major factor in the power shifts that are taking place in Egypt. We just wanted to say thank you to everyone who helped us out and to the various people that helped with our research on the ground in Egypt. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, our next presenter from the Epiclopian will be Jackie, Jackie Tresso. Uh, Jackie is a freshman at Tufts University studying in translations in Arabic. In addition to EPIC, she is involved in the IGL through Allies and Amnesty International. She is also a member of the Tufts Mountain Club and enjoys graphic design. 
Over winter break, she interviewed professors and administrators at the Army War College at the Carlisle and Spring Post and at the National Defense University at Fort McNair in D.C. The topic of her research was regarding international military fellowship programs and their effects on civil military relations in the region. And with that, I'd like to open the floor to Jackie. For my research, I went to those two institutions, Army War College and the National Defense University, and spoke to educators and administrators there um, about their uh, role in the international fellowship program. So why is this question important? Political scientists have theorized that there's a relationship between the government, the, the civilian sector, and the military that can help predict whether or not popular uprisings will be successful or not, based upon whether the security sector will uh, support uh, mass uh, support regime or uh, the general population during mass uh, protests. And in addition, military to military engagement has increasingly been used as a, as a form of war policy, especially as more traditional ties and diplomatic um, connection can't operate to their full capacity for whatever reason. So what is international military education and training? IMET is a joint DOD and state program that at its core is an instrument of U.S. national security and foreign policy that provides money to uh, friendly nations for mil uh, military education and training. Uh, with that, at these institutions, professional military uh, education institutions in America, um, for which there are more than just the two that I visited, um, there are international fellowship programs which help bring foreign officers and their families to live and work alongside their American counterparts and earn a graduate degree um, at, uh, at the programs. Um, about half of all of IMED's total budget goes to these programs. When you're looking at the effectiveness of anything, you have to look at first and define goals, which the Foreign Assistance Act states as uh, IMED should be to increase understanding between allied nations, uh, greater self-reliance for foreign, uh, foreign friendly nations, and uh, awareness, increase in awareness of international recognized human rights. Uh, goals are reached through a variety of ways, through formal seminars um, and education. Uh, the core classes really provide a common strategic language for uh, foreign officers and, uh, and American officers to communicate in, as well as a field studies program, which promotes foreign officers, uh, their, the fellows' uh, understanding of the American way of life. For example, um, they will go on field trips to the American prison system, among many others, to uh, really understand the way our country uh, operates. Uh, they have a more broad uh, understanding trust on. Um, what I found from many people I interviewed to supersede these two first parts, but also work in conjunction with them, was the importance of interpersonal relationships. Um, Mr. Kevin Brenner, Brenner also a Fletcher alum, um, who works at the Army War College as an international military uh, student, student management office, um, described relationships as the cheapest foreign policy we've ever had. Um, the reason why relationships are so important is because 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the line, uh, when uh, these foreign officers are in key strategic positions in their own military, they are able to have connections and networks with their American counterparts that they met at uh, the institutions, um, which can create beneficial outcomes for American security um, in, in the future. So there are challenges that are, um, to the existing ways that we track the effectiveness of the IMET program. Uh, first of all, surveys only go so far. They're done by the institutions themselves. Um, it's all self-reported. There has been an increased um, uh, an effort to make uh, sort of more formal networks uh, beyond just uh, uh, informal relationships through an international health bank, which brings back uh, key graduates uh, to the institutions. Um, and uh, another issue is that many of the benefits of these programs come, come out in very anecdotal ways. Uh, the largest example would be in Pakistan. Um, in 2003, a core, uh, a core commander um, in Pakistan was an Army War College graduate, and he let the United States uh, set up logistical bases for our efforts in Afghanistan, even though the Pakistani government was very much opposed to it, um, because he had those relationships in place from his time in college. So is, what question I kept asking was, is there a long-term return on investment? And uh, what I kept on hearing was this gut feeling phenomenon. I think so, so I can, but I can't prove it. Uh, Dr. Boldos uh, iterated this uh, uh, eloquently, saying that though there might be a systematic way to prove that these efforts um, really play out for American best strategic interests in our future, there's really no systematic way which it's already done. And the reason um, for this gap 
um, from tracking effectiveness is because there's no policy and there are therefore no funding. And though there might be great ideas to more formally engage um, the network of alumni, um, the, the offices are uh, officers in these uh, management offices are their hands are tied because there's no policy from Congress and therefore no resources um, to do so. It's also important to note that it's both practically and conceptually difficult to track the effectiveness of an education in general um, as well as informal communication networks. Civil military relations and the discussion of the American or Western normative um, presumption of civilian control of the military are heavily incorporated into IF international fellowship programs, um, and different PMEs do it in different ways, uh, but their entire discussion is devoted entirely to um, dis discussing uh, the effects um, of civil military relations. And, uh, and uh, an educator at the National Defense University explained to me that it's their his interest to show the class the benefits and the drawbacks of the system, and really provide an open place for discussion without really um, uh, without really um, subscribing beliefs on anybody. When you look at uh, the effect on the ground of civil military relations from the officers' experience in these courses, um, you really you really find that um, there is no evident uh, shift, and that's because um, as it was described to me by Dr. Larry Goodson, who is the department head at the, of national security at the uh, strategy at the U.S. Army War College, is that um, the, he doesn't, he's not sure if that the democracy model, model um, and therefore the inherent civil military um, model that's derived from that is necessarily appropriate or applicable to the Middle East at this time. Um, this was reiterated by Dr. McFate at the National Defense University, who brought into the context of a larger uh, political Islam question, um, stating that he thinks it's dogmatic and counterproductive to think that civilian control of the military is always uh, applicable everywhere at any time. Um, and he he viewed it was his role as an educator to bring up these questions and to provide the um, the place for uh, discussion and discourse on these issues rather than to promote um, one belief over the other. That's not to say that individual officers um, have self-assessed their views or have different views than the institutions uh, and militaries and governments where they come from, but in terms of real change in the ground, this was the overall um, opinions I received from those I interviewed. A perfect case study is Jordan. Uh, the members of the monarchy have a deep relationship with American PE institutions, and the affinity has trickled down. Uh, the Jordanian fellows are very engaged in um, and pro-American uh, when they uh, at their times in the um, institutions. But um, and, and for that reason, they might be one of our stronger allies in the region. But when you look at the breakdown of civil military relations in the Jordanian government, though there's a small elected house of parliament, um, it has no control over the military or foreign affairs. That's all done by um, appointed officials and the monarchy itself. So this just goes to show how relationships almost supersede any um, uh, shifts of or shifts of, of these countries towards what we view as American values um, and just proving how we can have great strategic allies in the region that don't necessarily follow um, our, our normative civilian military relation um, philosophy. So my conclusions are twofold. One, that the existing uh, methods to track effectiveness of the program are largely inadequate, um, and that there needs to be a policy and funding for a comprehensive study. Uh, as people I talked about recommended a 10-year comprehensive study to really see, um, really prove that how cost-effective this method of software policy really is. As well, the second conclusion I drew is that relationships are the primary way that the program benefits U.S. foreign policy, and that while civil military relations is a huge question to tackle, um, it's not necessarily um, the place of these institutions or these international fellowship programs to uh, to assess or um, shift views, but rather um, to provide a, sp a space for open discourse. Um, in conclusion, I'd like to thank Heather Sherman, Professor Schultz. Um, our lovely panelists and the undergraduate research fund and the Tufts IRB for um, which, which are the, my research would not be possible. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, it appears we have about 10 minutes left. I'd like to open directly to questions from the audience. Um, please keep your questions specific to one panelist and one question. Thank you very much. And just line up behind the microphones while I'll train between them. I think we'll have time for about four questions. Scott, uh, you better be down at the time you were supposed to be asked about the 
Because of the, this constitution was written against the backdrop of the perception of abusive presidencies, what we saw in this latest constitution was a trend to watering down the powers and prerogatives of the presidential office vis-a-vis parliament. Very good case is very good case in point is the formation of the government, which is now not the sole prerogative of the president but is the shared prerogative of the president and the majority party in parliament. So even with a CC presidency, and this was done before the, the, the prospects for a CC presidency became evident, even if you did have a member of the officer corps as president of the republic, he would 
sit in an office that is now significantly diminished in terms of its prerogatives and, and the balance of power that he would have to contend with uh, with Parliament. Thank you. Uh, I believe there's a question for I'm not um, sure how to answer. It is the case that um, that uh, if we think about Iran and, and Egypt and so on, these are um, these are locations with great histories and, and cultures. What seems to me has happened in, uh, in, in these uh, these states is that. Um, that the, the state has been captured. And, and, uh, once it, and, and, and capturing that state is in the hands of, of a, a elite that used these security institutions um, to, uh, to, to maintain control. And it makes it very difficult, uh, uh, I think, to change them and, and maybe to act on uh, you know, their great traditions and, and, and their past. And one of the things I did want to say, though, in uh, thinking about where security sector reform has worked, uh, we uh, Kirby brought up uh, uh, the East European states. Those are very, it's a very interesting uh, example of, of, of security sector reform. Why did it work? Uh, it worked uh, in part because there was a third party, in this case, NATO. That, uh, that was really able to manage uh, the, the process of transition through a, a, a reform mechanism that, uh, uh, that they were uh, in the part of. And, uh, and so, and of course, the East European countries, uh, they all wanted to be in data um, because of, um, of the experience they had, especially uh, in the post-World War II period, but even in, in the period before that. So, I remember I, I had a, a student uh, who uh, uh, was from Poland, and, uh, and he, was, uh, he was asked, this is in the 90s, well, why, why do you want to be in NATO? What makes you want to be in NATO? And he said, well, there are three reasons why we should be in NATO, World War I, World War II, and Poland. And, and, and so um, they wanted to be in NATO, but NATO uh, was a good third party that could manage that. And that's why I said that when I look at uh, some of the uh, uh, places in the Middle East where security sector reform is needed, I think there's a good goal for, for third parties in some of these places. Thank you. And a response from Dr. Thanks for asking this complex question. And uh, well, I'm, when, when, when I talked about security sector reforms, and I, I was focusing mainly on, on the army and the police, and uh, uh, yesterday I covered this issue from, like just touched on it gently, telling that the security sector reform started from just being trying to diminish the violations of the law to the, the minimal possible limit, moving through um, upgrading and enhancing the performance, overall performance of the military and police and judiciary, and ending at a, a more um, ambitious uh, stage where, where the performance of the security sector as a whole fits more into the, the national plan of development and education and advancement and progress. So back to the, 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 the question, I would say that uh, um, yes, uh, any, any institution in the world needs this. So if you speak specifically about the, US, the uh, Israeli army, I said in, in terms of some behaviors that have been displayed in the media, in some cases where uh, some of the uh, Palestinian prayers in, in, in Aqsa Mosque in some Fridays and in the holy days, uh, there was kind of hot confrontations in, in over use of, of, uh, of power sometimes. Uh, that's about the behavior. About the dogma itself, it's very um, instructive to the Israeli army and to the Egyptian army as well. And that reminds me of uh, what Morsi did in, in, in just very few days before he left, uh, he was deposited, uh, deposited from office, uh, when he declared the, the war, the jihadist war, against Syria. 
without getting back to the military. Um, and that was a colossal mistake that he committed to giving an official coverage to, to uh, terrorism activities. And, and what I want the Israeli army to do when it comes to the high, uh, the high levels of, of commandership or, or, or uh, the key officers, when they are asked to give their opinion about national security issues, they should tend to be peaceful, not uh, aggressive. In terms of, uh, yeah, for, for military commanders, it's very easy to say, okay, let's go to war, because this is the only thing that they are professional in, in doing. So it's easy, okay, but we have been quiet for some time, let's go for war. It shouldn't go like that. I mean, no, we have to focus more on need to make the, the, the region more peaceful. And I don't, I don't blame the Israeli army, by the way, for that. It's, it's the, the whole responsibility of not only Israel, the whole surrounding countries. We all have the same responsibility. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, uh, we're running short on time, and the next panel is starting at 2.30. So I'd like to thank you both David, again. David, just sure. take the answer. Your the question is, I'll give you uh, eight more minutes. Okay. Every one of these questions, but no more. I think I know what is. The panel is like nine minutes. Don't do it for you again. Not to, just to stand up between the two panels that we're competing on political discussions. So just let me hear the questions, and... All right, thank you. And rapid fire questions. Uh, we'll start on this side and go back and forth. Hi, my name is Vladimir Plekka from Russia, Russian Indonesian. First and foremost, thank you for your relevant speeches and your presentations. My uh, question is to Mr. Fugat. You mentioned in your speech the uh, successful case of cooperation between military and civilian society in Pakistan. Can this kind of uh, experience can be used in the creation of some consultation this year uh, to help those in Egypt, to help those in different countries uh, to create this uh, successful case of cooperation between military and civilian society? Thank you. <coughs> My name is Daniel Tankovic from Israel IDF. The question is about the Dr. Schultz. The panelist referred uh, mainly to Libya and Egypt as two different case studies uh, with undergone political transition and the uh, prospect for security reform in those uh, states. But what about states that haven't gone through uh, political transition by Jordan, Saudi Arabia, both states, uh, what measures they should take in order to avoid a political transition or political upheaval in their, uh, in their countries? Just I want to make one remark regarding Colonel uh, Razawi uh, about Israel uh, advices. We really don't take a, a, a peaceful or aggressive uh, stand. We use Thank you. Uh, my name is Dave Davidson. I'm a grandparent and a tough student. Uh, this is, question is for Mr. Haggad. Uh, how can the civilian authorities negotiate with the Egyptian military in a security sector reform context where the military owns and control, controls 30 to 40 percent of the economic structure of the entire country? My name is Marwa Farah. I'm a student from Stanford University, and my question is also for Mr. Haddad, and it's also very similar to the one just asked. You said that a problem for social security, uh, social security sector reform in Egypt is that the military has no partners across the negotiating table with you to talk because of the leaders of this nature of the revolution. Um, would you agree that that maybe in part is the military's own making? Hi, I'm Ahmed Mohamed from Egypt. I'm in uh, the United States Army War College. My question is to Dr. Charles. Uh, so you mentioned you, during your speech that the Egyptian armed forces is involved in economy and political. Uh, some other point of view may argue that this involvement is kind of supporting for the Egyptian people. If we take the example, uh, after President Hussein Mubarak being removed, the Egyptian people don't see except the Egyptian, Egyptian armed forces as an organization to take care of the country. And as soon as possible, they said, turn it back to civilian leaders. Second, after the 30th of June revolution, they didn't take power. They turned it to civilian leaders also. And for the economy involvement uh, regarding the question before, 
my question. It's type of preventing exploitation for the Egyptian people by any other sector. I'd like to hear your comments. Thank you. Last but not least, Nagara Zavi, Epic Alam. Uh, my question could be for any of you if you want to take it. I'm sorry for that, Chairman. Um, but there's been a very sanitization of the language of security in this panel, and I think we need to talk about the torture that's been committed by security forces, especially in Egypt, um, the killing of unarmed civilians and protesters, and the um, or random arbitrary arrests of people. Um, so how can there be security reform if we can't even have an honest discussion about that violence? Thank you. Um, let me start with the last one. There's no attempt here to sanitize the discussion of security, and in fact, the point you know, I was making, maybe I could have been more um, normative in, in my language, uh, is that uh, the, the, the nature of the regimes in the region were deep states. And these deep states were, 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 were maintained in power by security forces that were unregulated by the rule of law, just the opposite. So I, I could have said it more normatively, um, but there's no attempt here to sanitize this. So it wasn't necessarily towards you. Well, anyway, well, towards anyone. Now, um, with respect to. Um, uh, to the question um, about from, about the Egyptian uh, military, I, I mean, I I, I agree with um, with much of um, of what uh, Kareem has said. Um, the idea, however, uh, of electing uh, a general to be president, um, uh, maybe Egypt has to go through this this time. But normally, in a in a, um, a civil military structure. Uh, the, the person can't just take off the uniform and become president. There has to be a process whereby at a time uh, that, uh, that goes uh, before you do that. With respect to um, to the economy, um, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, you probably know the economy better than I do, but it seems to me that the military has a big chunk of the economy, um, and, uh, and and and. Their, their, their control over that is not regulated by civilians. And um, uh, it, uh, it gives them uh, uh, a, a great economic um, advantage. And, and frankly, in a, in a, in a, a civilian, uh, in my concept of civil military relations, the military uh, budget, first of all, is, is not theirs to determine the civilians, and certainly. Um, their, their, their role in the economy is minimal. Thank you. Um, can we hear from Mr. Dada, please? Dada. Um, Pakistan. Um, what I think many Pakistan observers, I'm not one of them, I sort of know this second hand, but I think many Pakistan observers see last year's election as a watershed moment in that it was the first time a civilian elected government transfers power to another civilian elected government. Um, th th this points out what I think is something that may come across as a counterintuitive when we talk about militaries and politics, in that militaries often initiate or, or put the country on the path of democratic transition. Pakistan is one example. Portugal, going back to the 1970s, is another example. Turkey. We've talked a lot about Egypt, which is um, which is has shown a very important precedent of the military actually handing over power to a civilian elected president in an experiment that unfortunately went very very wrong. But you do have the, these precedents of militaries taking power, for the most part, on the back of or in response uh, to uh, popular protests against authoritarian regimes, and then putting in a process in place that eventually leads to the uh, democratic transition. The military and the economy. Um, a lot of people talk about the economic activities of the Egyptian military. I would claim that very few people actually know the extent of these activities, me myself being one. I would highly doubt the 30 or 40 percent figure, 40 cents out of each dollar of the Egyptian economy goes to the military, um, I think is somewhat suspect. Now, having said that, 
the, this is an important issue. I mean, the Egyptian military, the, the nexus between the military and economic activity, I would mean, think, is something that is unique to the Egyptian military. This, like a number of issues related to the status of the military in Egypt, is something I think that will evolve. It will evolve with the changing political context and with the economic context. So, if you're looking for a quick answer to this question, I don't have one. All I can say realistically is, when we assess this particular issue, like all the other issues related to security sector reform, we have to take the long view. The absence of a civilian, credible civilian negotiating um, partner for the military. Is the military responsible? I don't think anybody is blameless in the situation Egypt finds itself. I think it, this points to the broad problem, or the broader problem, of political reform in Egypt. There, were, there was no real politics in Egypt for the last 30, 40 years, some would say for the last 60 years. So expecting the emergence of a credible civilian leadership that can negotiate these very complex issues of security sector reform is something that I would also take. And just one last quick remark by Dr. Balkisov. Um, yes, about the question about sanitization. And actually, uh, sanitization wasn't at all uh, part of what I at least tried to say or, or to let you know. Uh, because uh, of the fact that uh, I talked in one slide, I dedicated to accountability. Accountability is that everyone should be held responsible for what he does from the police. And I say that this is the future of, of reform, that we reach a positive um, a level of accountability where, where no one can do anything and, and still go uh, in, in, with immunity from being uh, subject to uh, punishment for, for violation of the law. But let me add something to this, which is very informative and instructive to some people who may not know that police violations all over the world are endless, including the United States of America. If I had time, I could have displayed for you scenes from your own country here, from Canada, from France, from Italy. I have them already on my flesh. If you have time later, I can write. Then you will never forget, you will never think that this might happen in your country, but it does. The only difference here is you have a accountability system strong here. But still, the accountability system in Egypt is not that strong. That's what we want to have in the future. We do not say that there is no culture in Egypt is paradise. No one said that. We said that we are moving on, on the issue of reforming in a very gentle way, not to lose this institution, because if this institution collapses today, then the community will collapse afterwards. That's what we try to say. Thank you so much.